Okay, I'm guessing everyone's sort of getting tired and burnt out. Uh, yeah, I saw some people nodding heads here. Okay, so uh, I'll, this is, uh, I'm going to keep this light and um, feel free to ask questions, okay? Uh, also, thanks, Jen, that was a really nice introduction. It makes my life a lot easier. Uh, so to, I'm basically going to focus on topological crystalline insulators in this talk. And what I hope to show you, actually, I'm, going to ho I'm hoping to answer some of the questions raised uh, in the, uh, after the pre previous lecture. One of the questions has to do with how robust these surface states are to disorder. So I'll address that a little bit. I'll also talk about you know, how exactly can you probe uh, how these, uh, whether or not these are Dirac surface states and how you can show that these are protected by mirror symmetry uh, in this case in particular. So I'll try to answer those kinds of questions, okay? And uh, sort of the talk is organized in the following way. Initially, I'll talk about uh, topological crystalline insulators and one system in particular, and I'll show you that we can prove using scanning tunneling microscopy that these states are indeed protected by mirror symmetry, right? And the way we show that is when we break mirror symmetry, the Dirac uh, uh, cones acquire a mass. So we can show that by using Landau level spectroscopy, right? By turning on a magnetic field, we can have Landau levels. And by looking at these Landau levels, we can actually clearly see whether we have massless Dirac fermions or whether these things are acquiring a mass. And we can actually use STMs to, to see that mirror symmetry is broken. Okay, and then, uh, it, uh, and then the next thing I would like to do is these materials are highly tunable. So one beautiful thing about this system is by changing the alloy composition, you can go from a topological phase to a trivial phase. So I actually want to follow that phase transition and see uh, how uh, the bands evolve as you uh, go through this uh, phase transition. In particular, I want to see what happens to the surface states as you go through this phase transition. And so a couple of surprising things happen, okay? So that's what I want to talk about. And finally, if I have time, uh, I, I want to talk about how you can use strain to actually um, change the properties of these uh, Dirac surface states. This system is similar to graphene in the sense that because the Dirac points are located at momenta uh, away from the Brillouin zone boundaries, strain can have a huge effect on the Dirac points. Strain can create uh, pseudo-magnetic fields, uh, pretty high pseudo-magnetic fields, and lead to pseudo-Landau levels. Uh, strain can also dramatically shift the position of the drag points in momentum space, and these are all related to one another. And I'll show you how we can realize strain, inhomogeneous strain, and how we can measure it using STM, using quasi-particle interference, if I can get to that. Okay, so let's just start. Uh, so this work was done uh, by a whole bunch of people. Uh, STM was carried out by Yoshinori Okada, Ilya Zelkovic, Daniel Walkup, and Badi Asaf. We got really nice single crystals from SC Cha's group in Taiwan. And uh, we had a huge bunch of the theory help from Liang Fu, uh, Evelyn, Shin Lin, and uh, uh, Shin's group. Uh, actually, Shin is no longer uh, in Singapore. He's in Taiwan now. Okay. Uh, I think I'm not going to go through much, too much of an introduction s since Jennifer has given a great introduction already. I just want to point out a couple of things. One is that TCIs are trivial under the Z2 classification. However, they have a churn number, which is the mirror churn number that uh, Jennifer talked about. And in the particular case of the TCIs I'll be talking about, the mirror churn number is uh, minus two. Um, so, uh, you, uh, you know, it, yes, that there's a paper in 2008 that talks about mirror churn number uh, protected uh, topological phases, but the word was coined, TCIs as a word uh, was coined by Liang Fu in a paper in 2011. And basically, actually very soon afterwards in 2012, uh, uh, certain materials were predict to, predicted to be topological crystalline insulators, and then ARPES measurements showed the presence of a surface state, so this is a surface state, uh, 
at low temperatures. Interestingly, TCIs are, are, can also be controlled by temperature. So this particular composition at room temperature uh, is trivial. And as you go to low temperatures, actually goes through a topological phase transition. And at low temperatures, you see the emergence of the surface state. Um, OK, actually, I'm going to just skip this. So the one thing I want to point out is, uh, it, you know, in comparison to a Z2 topological insulator, a topological crystalline insulator has multiple Dirac cones inside the Brillouin zone. And for example, in the materials that I'm going to talk about, there are four uh, distinct uh, Dirac cones within the Brillouin zone, right? And this has its own consequences. Um, one, one visual way to see the effects of mirror symmetry is the following. So uh, the material class that I'm going to be talking about is this lead telluride, uh, tin telluride, tin selenide family of materials. These have a rock salt crystal structure. So you have uh, an alternating arrangement of tin, tellurium, tin, tellurium atoms in a, in a cubic structure, right? And you can see uh, from the structure that there are a mirrors, a mirror planes in, in this material. So one way to think about the system is if you, just did, uh, if you just thought about the kinds of surface states that might actually occur on the system, you, can fi you will find, if you just did field theory, that there would be actually two surface states, one shown in pink and the other shown in blue. And in the absence of any symmetries, they intersect in the circle in the absence of any particular symmetries. They would simply gap out entirely, and you wouldn't see any Dirac cones. And so you can see clearly that the moment you have a mirror symmetry uh, along this direction, at these two points, right, at this point and this point, uh, the, the mirror symmetry prevents the gapping out of these uh, uh, cones at those points. And that's how you end up with uh, these four Dirac nodes inside this Brillouin zone. OK. So here's the sort of theoretically predicted uh, band structure. And here's ARPES data. This is close to the Dirac points. So these are actually the four Dirac points. The one interesting thing in the system, which I'd like to point out is, so this is just a one part of the Brillouin zone, right? This Dirac point here would be, let's say, this one. This Dirac point would be this one. So here is a nice Dirac cone right at this point. The interesting thing is because the Dirac points lie so close to the Brillouin zone boundary, as you go to higher energies, the, these two Dirac cones actually start uh, merging with one another. And one, when that happens, you get something called a Lifshitz transition, where uh, you start with two um, um, hole-like pockets, and you transition into one electron pocket and one hole pocket, right? So there's a Lifshitz transition, and that Lifshitz transition actually, this is a Lifshitz transition as a function of energy, uh, is accompanied by the presence of a Van, Van Hoff singularity. So the way you, uh, you can visualize that is right here where they merge, there's a, there's a sort of flattening of the bands. And when the bands flatten like this, the density of states, uh, you get a peak in the density of states whenever this happens in 2D. OK, so in, when you do STM spectroscopy, you should actually see a peak in the density of states uh, at this point and at this point. OK, um, so the questions we'd like to answer are the following. Uh, you know, uh, is, this a, is this a Dirac system? Is the dispersion linear near the Dirac point? Uh, are the surface states topologically protected by mirror symmetry? Can you open up a gap by breaking mirror symmetry? What about the role of disorder, right? Is this a system susceptible to disorder? I mean, uh, I'll show you, actually, because these are alloys, there's a huge amount of apparent disorder. Does that mean that you no longer have well-defined Dirac nodes in the system? Uh, so these are the kinds of questions I'd like to answer. So these single crystals are actually surprisingly easy to cleave, given that they're cubic crystals. So here's a nice single crystal. And uh, when we cleave it, the natural cleave plane, for some reason, I'm not sure what, uh, it gives you the 001 surface. 
And uh, this is the 001 surface. And if you look at the surface, you should see an alternating arrangement of uh, lead and selenium atoms, OK? Um, so this is a topography taken by STM. And if you look at the, um, sorry, if you look at the distance between the atoms that we see here, it actually corresponds to one of the two sublattices. So at low energies, so this is about 100 millivolts, at low energies with STM, we see only one of these two sublattices. So we either see only the selenium atoms or only the lead atoms. And in fact, as it turns out, at low energies, I think this is actually the selenium lattice, OK? And what we, I'll show you later is that at, you know, if you increase the STM bias to about one volt or something, you'll see both sublattices. And actually, that tells you something really important. OK. So if you, if you uh, sit at any one point here in this material and take a DIDV spectrum, it looks like this. Uh, the beautiful thing about this system is you can actually see the consequence of linear dispersion directly in the DIDV spectrum, right? So you have linear dis linearly dispersing states, and, uh, and if you ask yourself in 2D what the density of states should look like, it should look like a straight line, and in fact, that's what we see here. So this here at minus, uh, around minus 50 millivolts below the uh, Fermi energy is where the Dirac point lies in the system, and these are, these are the two Dirac cones. Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. These, this, this is the Dirac cone. Uh, these two peaks in the density of states are the Van Hoff singularities associated with the Lipschitz transition. So if I were to compare this uh, band structure uh, with my spectrum, what I would find is that the minimum of the spectrum should correspond to the Dirac point. These peaks, these two peaks, should correspond to uh, these two uh, places where uh, you have a flattening of the bands due to the Lipschitz transition. OK, so um, uh, now let's use scanning tunneling microscopy to probe the Dirac surface states in the system, and let's see what we find. Um, so what we do is we turn on a magnetic field. And uh, as you all know, when we turn on a magnetic field, uh, electrons follow cyclo cyclotron orbits. And in a, ba in a band, you have uh, they fall into these discrete levels called Landau levels. Each of these discrete levels is labeled by an integer, uh, uh, by n, which is an integer in this case. So you can actually pretty much use semi, semi classical physics to understand uh, the energy uh, distribution of these Landau levels for any given system because the area, right? in momentum space should, it's just given by this, which is, you know, you, you want the uh, orbits to close on themselves coherently, and that gives you a constraint. So that's just semi-classical. And here, n is an integer, and gamma is a phase that you pick up, right? It it's actually uh, uh, includes the Berry's phase in it. So for an ordinary two-dimensional electron gas, gamma equals half, right? So the area in momentum space is pi k squared, and uh, you can just, you know that energy goes as k squared, and that just tells you that the lambda levels should go uh, as n. So that means that in a two deg, this is the sequence of lambda levels that you expect to get. Now, if you compare uh, that with the Dirac uh, uh, surface state, here gamma is zero. So uh, the, the area is simply proportional to NB, as it turns out. That means the energy space thing goes as square root NB, right? And for a, the, the lambda level spacing in, in a, for a Dirac system are actually unevenly spaced. So there's a huge difference between these two scenarios. So basically, if you were to look at the differences, here you have lambda levels that are not equally spaced, right? And the most important thing is you're expected to have one Landau level exactly at the Dirac node. And this, the energy of this Landau level, which is ED, should not change with magnetic field. Whereas uh, all of these other energies actually change with magnetic field. Now, what if you had massive Dirac fermions, right? Let's say you were to break uh, 
uh, mirror symmetry and you were to give uh, the electrons a mass, the spectrum now looks like this. And in this case, in both of these cases, the high energy spectrum far from, uh, far from this, uh, the gapped out portion will look very similar, right? But at low energies, uh, while in the massless case you have uh, one uh, Landau level which doesn't disperse with magnetic field, in this case, in the massive case, you also have one non-dispersing Landau level. However, it doesn't lie in the middle of, uh, of, the, of the dispersion. It either lies on top of this band or at the bottom of this band, and where it lies depends on the sign of the mass. Okay? If the mass is positive, it lie, it'll lie on one side. If the mass is negative, it'll lie on the other. So you can have uh, either. So the one thing I do want to point out, again, semi-classically speaking, is because, uh, because it's the area that, depends, uh, that determines the Landau levels, you can actually show clearly, uh, you can actually show that the momentum for each Landau level, this is just an average momentum, goes as square root nb, right? So simply by plotting the, uh, the energy of the Landau levels with square root nb, you should be able to see linear dispersion, right? Okay, because you have e versus k. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We'll turn on a magnetic field. We'll pick up all the Landau level energies and we'll plot them as a function of square root nb. We'll change the field and do the same thing over and over again and we'll see what we see, okay? So here's the spectrum again at a zero field. And now we turn on a field. This is 7.5 Tesla. And you see all these wiggles. And each of these wiggles is a Landau level. And now this is a plot of uh, how the spectrum evolves as a function of magnetic field. So you can see there are a bunch of these wiggles. And in fact, this is a derivative. You can see it much more clearly here. Um, let me just draw lines to guide your eye. So you can see the n equals 1, 2 uh, level, and so on. They change their position as a function of magnetic field, if you can track these curves. However, there is this n equals 0 that actually doesn't move as a function of magnetic field. Okay? And you, you can ask how exactly these were indexed, because that's a really important question. The way we index these is to, it's to say that if these are indexed correctly, when you plot the energy as a function of square root nb, they should all collapse onto one line. That's the constraint for indexing these levels. Okay? So let's say you do this, and now let's look at the resulting dispersion. Yes? So what are the pieces that are not indexed? This one and this one? Yeah, I'll, I'll, those are my mystery peaks that I'll get to in one second. Uh, so since you bring it up, this is, I, I, I really like to put, do this because someone in the audience inevitably asks me, and it's a great opportunity for me to say, aha, good, good, good catch. So, so we have these two peaks on either side of n equals zero, which also, if I were to draw da dotted lines, which also don't disperse, okay? And this is, this is what we actually discovered when we measured this uh, material, and I'll show you in, in a bit these tell us that we have massive Dirac fermions in the system. But just give me a few seconds. OK. So let's say I plot all of this. I plot all these peaks as a function of square root nb. This is the real data. OK. Now, here is the Dirac point. It's this energy, right? The, it doesn't change. So they're all lying on top of each other. One interesting thing here is if you had a large g factor, uh, the position of this peak would move as well. And so the fact that the, this peak doesn't move means that the g factor in the system is pretty small. It's probably close to 2. OK. So, so if you were to, so uh, ignoring these two um, non-dispersing peaks for a second, if you wanted to actually uh, draw a line that connected all these dots with the Dirac point and follow through, there's no way you can do it without drawing straight lines. So basically, this gives you beautiful linear dispersion right near the drag cone, OK? Um, there's something interesting going on here. There's a jump from at right at minus 40 millivolts. And in fact, if you look at what's going on, uh, this part of the drag cone is here at low energies. 
And at high energies, this, is, this actually is above the Lifshitz transition. So this jump is exactly due to the Lifshitz transition where the Dirac cone, the two Dirac cones meet each other and undergo a Lifshitz, Lifshitz transition. In fact, there's a doubling of the area um, of these Landau levels due to the Lifshitz transition. Okay, now let's talk about these, uh, these non-dispersing Landau levels on either side of the Dirac point, right? So where are they coming from? There's, there's no other choice. There's no way to get non-dispersing Landau levels um, except to imagine that we have somehow, in addition to having massless Dirac fermions, which give you this peak, we also have mass uh, massive Dirac fermions uh, which give you these two peaks. And in fact, we not only have massive Dirac fermions, we need to have uh, two different masses, a positive mass and a negative mass, right? So, so the question is, how do you do that? Well, you have to break the symmetry that protects the Dirac cones. So uh, the, the, pr the symmetry in this system is mirror symmetry. So, so the, how do you break mirror symmetry? Well, you need to distort the lattice. So the conjecture is the following. So this is the lattice, which is not distorted. It has two mirror symmetry planes, this one and this one, right? And now let's just distort the lattice in this very peculiar way. So let's take one of the sublattices. Let's uh, take the orange sublattice and move all the atoms in, in this direction uh, and take the yellow sublattice and move all the atoms in this direction. So we move the sublattices with respect to each other in this particular direction. Uh, if you were to do that, you can see immediately that mirror symmetry is preserved in this direction, but broken in this direction, right? So if you, if you, if you, take, if you take this point, it has no partner. So mirror symmetry is broken in one direction, but preserved in the other. So if you, if you uh, end up with a situation like this, what will happen is, remember, in the Brillouin zone, there are four Dirac cones. Because mirror symmetry is broken in one direction, two of them will get gapped out. And whereas in the other direction, you'll preserve the Dirac cones, uh, the massless Dirac fermions. So this is the conjecture, OK? The, the more important thing is that uh, Liang Fu had shown in one of his papers that if this were to happen, then due to symmetry constraint necessarily, the, each of these Dirac cones must have an op, the opposite mass, okay? They should have opposite masses. So, so then in this case, what you'll get is uh, from these two Dirac cones, you'll get uh, the uh, you know, Landau level right at the Dirac point, and from this one, you'll get one here, from this one, you'll get one here. You put them all together, and you get two, three non-dispersing peaks, which is exactly what we see. So the question then is, is mirror symmetry really broken, right? Now, when I showed you the low bias lattice, I showed you only one of the two sublattices, remember? And that's why the lattice looks so beautiful. It's perfectly square. So you can't tell from that whether mirror symmetry is broken, because you can't see both sublattices, OK? However, if you go to higher biases, now you see Basically, here you're resolving both sublattices. Now, this looks much messier in, than this, and the reason is the following: It's not that the uh, positions of the atoms are, are uh, you know, disordered. It's the fact that you have lead and tin substituting for each other, and you have about in this particular compound you have 34% uh, tin, right, substituting for lead. 34%, it's a large number. That means that even visually you can see the material should in theory be extremely disordered. So every third atom, a lead atom, should be substituted by a tin atom. So that's what gives you this apparent disorder. Um, so we can show in multiple ways that uh, if you take the high energy uh, uh, topography, uh, that we've broken mirror symmetry. One way is to look at the phase of the Fourier transform. So if you look at the imaginary part of the Fourier transform, that's the phase of the Fourier transform. For the low energy, energy topography, you basically see nothing. Uh, but for the high energy topographies, you see points in one direction, but no points in the other. And that tells you that mirror symmetry is broken. 
But even if you didn't do that, you should be able to see with your eye that mirror symmetry is broken. And it's hard to see because this is very messy, but what we can do is construct something called an average unit cell, which where what we, all we do is we go to each unit cell and we add up all the unit cells in this, uh, in this, um, in this field of view. And we, when we construct that average unit cell, that's what this, this looks like. This is the average unit cell. And now you can see very clearly from this average unit cell that exactly what we thought was happening is happening, meaning that the, the red sublattice and the yellow sublattice have shifted with respect to one another, and then mirror symmetry is preserved in one direction, red broken in the other. Okay? So, uh, yeah? But are the, the substitutions are randomly oriented and then it zigzags, or the substitutions are not random? Or? So the, 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 the substitutions are completely random, and that's why the topography looks like this. Yeah. Um, the zigzag is a surface reconstruction. And it's perfectly, uh, it's not random at all. The whole crystal that in our field of view, it's coherently distorted, right? So the, this distortion is completely uh, coherent over our entire field of view, and only the substitutions are random, right? So, so yes? Yeah, so this distortion is only present on the surface. Okay, it's a surface distortion. And I'll show you in a few minutes how we know that. So actually we do know that we did some, there are some x-ray studies that were done that show that. The bulk, it remains uh, pristine, undistorted. So we know from that that this, this should be a surface distortion. But there's another way we know that, and I'll show you in a second. Okay. So let me answer a few questions now. So we do see beautiful linear dispersion near the Dirac point. Uh, we can prove just by this that the surface states are indeed protected by mirror symmetry because the moment you break mirror symmetry, uh, you, can, you can see a gap, right? You, uh, the Dirac nodes are gapped out. What about the role of disorder? We have a giant amount of disorder in the system, but the, the Dirac cones that were pristine and not still um, un, um, un, uh, you know, where the mass is zero, the Dirac point uh, a position in energy, uh, as well as the fact that there's no mass for the, those Dirac points right within our resolution, tells you that disorder uh, is, is not a problem for TCIs, and you might ask why, right? One way to understand why disorder, local disorder doesn't create a problem is the following. There's a natural length scale in, this, uh, in these materials, which is given by the energy gap, the bulk energy gap, and the uh, Fermi velocity, right? That natural length scale also tells you how far the surface states penetrate into the bulk. So the idea is that as long as if you average the disorder over that natural length scale, if you, have a, if you restore mirror symmetry, then the Dirac node continues to be protected. Okay? So this disorder is completely random, and when, when averaged over that length scale, uh, you know, mirror symmetry is restored, and therefore uh, the Dirac cones remain protected because we don't see any uh, gapping out of the Dirac cones. So uh, we don't do any averaging. Our experimental observation is that, that, that the Dirac node is, uh, does a, that the Dirac point doesn't acquire a mass, that the electrons don't acquire a mass. That's our experimental observation. And we know that because we can, uh, you saw the data, right? We can track, right. So within our resolution, the, there's no mass. Yes? Say that again, please. Ah, so these are not necessarily, I mean, we don't break time reversal symmetry in this system. I think that if you broke time reversal symmetry, you may also, uh, you may in addition give these Dirac cones a mass, but we don't, you know, that time reversal symmetry doesn't play a big role in protecting these particular Dirac nodes, right? So it's just mirror symmetry. Yeah. Um, okay. 
Okay, so now I'd, what I'd like to do is go through the uh, phase transition. So this is a phase diagram. This tells you how much tin you have in this compound. So it's lead, tin, uh, selenide. It's an alloy, right? So tin is substituting for lead. Um, actually, when the amount of tin is zero, it's a, it's a trivial material. And it's only when you add about 18 to 19% tin that it becomes topologically non-trivial. And this, this was known a long time ago that the bands actually invert as a function of tin, right? People who studied these materials for thermoelectric properties knew that band inversion was happening. Um, so, so what I'd like to do is basically uh, ask the following question. Can we see this transition and what does it tell us? So uh, on the topologically non-trivial side, you have these two Dirac cones, this one and this one, right? And this is sort of the Lifshitz transition. As the bands uh, get closer together, the bulk bands get closer, these two bands, these two surface states should actually start merging with one another, right? You can see that visually. And the question is, what does this look like at the critical point? And then what does this look like on the trivial side? There has to be, we have to be able to, uh, you know, sort of continuously go from one side to the other. So we need to answer this question. So let's see what happens. And I'm going to still use Landau level spectroscopy. I'm going to simply march through these four uh, compositions. Uh, and uh, one of them is a critical composition. OK, so this is a, the, one of the topological samples. You can see you turn on a magnetic field, you see all these Landau levels. These are the two mass peaks, and this is the peak at the direct point, right? And uh, now let's do the following. Let's go to the next uh, doping, which is uh, going now more towards the trivial side. And you can already see there's a change. First, the position of the Van Hoff singularities has moved inwards, as you would expect for the two direct cones to be getting closer to one another. The second thing is, interestingly, the position of the mass peaks has also moved inwards, OK? And now let's do the critical composition. It, uh, for the critical composition, we no longer have the Van Hove singularities, right? And that makes sense because the two Dirac cones are now sitting right on top of one another, OK? So we have only, you know, for, for us doing land level spectroscopy, we see only one of the Dirac cones in that sense. We see both together, if you want to put that way. Uh, we still have a Dirac point. We have a, a peak right at the Dirac point. Uh, however, it's a bit broad. It's broader than uh, uh, the topological, what you see in the topological phase. OK, and now let's go to the trivial phase. We still see land levels. That means it's, a, it's, a, it's got a surface state. So the trivial uh, material has a surface state. However, at, right at the Dirac point, there is, no, there is no peak in the Landau level spectroscopy. So, so we've transitioned from having Dirac cones on the topological side to having a surface state with no Dirac point, OK? And now I can play the same game. I can collapse all the data by plotting energy as a function of square, square root nd, right? So this is the topological side. And you can see the two mark piece. You, send, you can see the Dirac point, And this is the dispersion. Uh, this is still topological. This is the critical point, right? This was the smeared out Dirac point. Still, it lies nicely on something that looks like a Dirac cone, right? It's just smeared out. So I don't understand this very well. And on this side, what we see is something that looks like Rushba split Dirac cones. OK? So that's how the material transitions. All right, OK. But the interesting thing here is that the mass is going down as you get to the critical point, And the question is why, right? So, so this is our picture. This is what is happening. These two things get closer and closer. This is the critical point. And then on the trivial side, you get the Rushba split uh, surface states. So the ma what's going on with the mass? If you look at the mass, it's getting smaller and smaller. And in fact, if you, this is a plot of the, uh, the mass as a function of tin composition. Uh, it, it goes to 0 right at the critical point. But then it, why, the question is, why does it steadily get smaller? And one of the possibilities is that 
the magnitude of this distortion is actually changing. Remember, this is a surface reconstruction, and each point here is a different alloy. And perhaps, as you're changing the alloy composition, the distortion is getting smaller and smaller, right? That means the mass would, maybe the mass would get smaller. But in fact, we measured the distortion for all of these alloys, and they all, the magnitude of the distortion is pretty similar across the entire um, composition. Um, so, so then the question is what's going on, because the mass is changing a lot, and the distortion doesn't change at all. Uh, the other, other possibility is the following. So you, we know that the surface state, the way to get a transition from a topological phase to a trivial phase is that the surface state at the, at the critical point must penetrate the entire sample. So the surface state penetration depth actually uh, goes uh, in this fashion. It, it, this is the Fermi velocity, which actually doesn't change much, by the way, as you go from one side to the other. Uh, this is the gap, the bulk energy gap. So you can see, basically, just by looking at this, is that the surface state penetration depth uh, should exponentially increase as you go towards the uh, critical point, right? And so, uh, so the idea is the following. Our distortion happens only on the surface. However, the surface state penetrates more and more into the bulk as we go towards the critical point. Therefore, the fraction of the surface state electrons that are actually sampling the distortion gets smaller and smaller. And that's why the mass gets smaller and smaller as we go towards the critical point. So, so we, you know, we did some simulations, and we, or, or we did some first principle calculations as well, and we could show this, this might actually be the reason that the mass is getting small. OK, so, so that's just that's, you know, some of the stuff that we've learned by doing Landau-level spectroscopy on these materials. Um, and I, I want to talk about strain. And so before I do that, does anyone have any questions? OK, all right. So the next thing I want to show you is that these materials are highly tunable by strain. So strain is a pretty cool tuning knob. Uh, in fact, it's been more and more important recently because uh, strontium ruthenate, for example, you can enhance TC, I think, now even by a factor of two uh, uh, if you strain the material. Oh, wow. Um, I, you know, Mike Cromie has done some beautiful work on graphene where he's shown that if you have inhomogeneous strain of a particular kind, you can have giant uh, pseudomagnetic fields of up to 300 Tesla. And in fact, before we started doing this work, there were a whole bunch of theory predictions that showed that in TCI, strain should do something very similar to graphene. It should shift the momentum space. Uh, in fact, it should create pseudomagnetic fields. And different from graphene, because the Dirac nodes are shifted away from the Brillouin zone boundaries, it should actually shift the momentum, momentum space positions of these Dirac nodes. And in, in the extreme case, it could create a topological to trivial crossover. So the idea is that as you strain the material, the Dirac nodes should move in momentum space. And with STM, we should be able to measure this. OK? Um, so so l let me just uh, say one quick thing. B b if you move the Dirac points in momentum space, right? you go from a Dirac point at some k to k plus delta, um, this is exactly like having a vector potential. And as long as A is spatially var varying such that the curl of A is non-zero, you can get pseudo-magnetic fields. So this is one way of seeing how changing the position of the Dirac points in momentum space can actually give you a pseudo-magnetic field. But the most important thing here is that the strain, which is causing this delta K, should actually be spatially varying. Okay. So how do you generate spatially varying strain? One way is uh, to use uh, MBE uh, 
And so let me just show you, this is like work done in 2002. This is heteroepitaxy. This is lead telluride deposited on lead selenide. And what you notice is these large structures. And if you look at this length scale, this is 200 angstroms. So over 200 angstroms, you get these large uh, modulation of the surface. And this, uh, and this kind of modulation encodes spatially varying strain. So what we did is the following. We cleaved our samples in C2 and then deposited um, a, a, a TCI on top of the sample. And then we st used STM to study that. So, so here's what we did. We cleaved lead selenide, um, and then we deposited tin telluride, which is supposed to be t a TCI. So let's actually see what we ex uh, let's see what we expect. So here's the sample lead selenide. This is the substrate. Um, as you deposit the first layer of atoms, the first layer conforms very well to the, to the substrate, right? It's it's actually able to leave this. It's not able to relieve the strain, it simply conforms. But as, as you deposit more and more layers, what you're supposed to see is a formation of these dislocations uh, that help relieve the strain. So, uh, so what happens is, as you increase the thickness, the, the, uh, the number of these dislocations increases until you get to a certain point where you have a nice network of dislocations and the strain is complete, completely relieved. You can actually calculate, uh, given a particular lattice mismatch, what that density of dislocations should be. So here's our data. So here's tin telluride deposited on uh, lead selenide. Um, this is less than one monolayer, and we see no dislocations whatsoever. So this is a very strained sample, but this is not inhomogeneously strained. This is homogeneously strained. So when you get to two to three monolayers, you start seeing these lines. These, each of these lines is a dislocation, OK? And then you get to about 20 monolayers. You see them, the dislocation lines really well. And about at 40 monolayers, uh, it's saturated. All the strain has been relieved. However, you're, you're left with this beautiful network of dislocations that gives you a spatially varying um, in homogeneous strain, okay? So this is what the surfaces look like at 40 monolayers. Um, you, can, you can see that the quality of the samples is pretty good. We can see all the atoms, right, if you zoom in. I mean, you can't see it in this field of view, but if you zoom in, you can see all the atoms arranged nicely. Uh, so now, yes? Actually, they want to stay away from each other. So, so that, that gives you this periodic arrangement, yeah. It's, it's, known, for, it's, be, it's known that they, they would like to do that, the dislocations, to minimize energy, yeah. Um, so so let's, let's ask the question, how do we determine strain, right? Uh, one nice way to determine strain is there's an, uh, we use, we use a, something called a lawler fujita algorithm. We usually use this to do drift correction, but what it really does is it tells you how much each atom is shifted from what should have been its, its, uh, its perfect lattice position. We can do, just use a computer to cal do that calculation. So, uh, so for example, this is just a test case where the middle region has been uh, compressed, and, uh, uh, compressed and stretched respectively. And we use the Lawler Fujita algorithm, and we were able to get the strain map. Okay, so we can do that and run the algorithm on this topography, and this is our strain map. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is only compressive and tensile strain. I'm not showing you uniaxial or shear strain. I'll show you that in a few minutes. So if you look at the compressive and tensile strain map. Uh, you realize that you have large regions of compressive strain and other regions of tensile strain, okay? And you can ask the following question, how does this affect the, uh, the surface states, right? Can you actually tell that the momentum space position of the Dirac nodes is shifting in response to the strain? Okay, I have 10 more minutes and I'm gonna sort of try to hurry through this. 
So to do that, we use, use quasi-particle interference, right? And that, it's a pretty neat technique. So what we, we take advantage of is the fact that there are natural scattering centers in, this, uh, in all the samples that we study. So if you have an incoming wave of electrons that are scattered by some scattering center in your system, the incoming and outgoing waves interfere with one another and create an interference pattern that we can capture with STM. The nice thing about this interference pattern is that the, the periodicity of the interference pattern encodes in it the, wave, uh, the, the wavelengths of the incoming and outgoing waves. So we can back, just by looking at the periodicity of the interference pattern, we can backtrack and get the Fermi surface. And we've done this many, many times for many different materials. Okay, so this is the technique we'd like to use. And, and, and just in 1D, you can see how beautifully this might work. So if you have just one-dimensional, um, you know, plane wave-like states, uh, STM measures psi squared, which would be a constant, so you wouldn't see anything. But if you have a scattering center, then the scattered states would just be e to the i kx plus e to the minus i kx. And then psi squared would give you cosine 2k, which gives you waves in STM. Right? So this is just, this is being very simplistic. In, in general, what we measure is just the, uh, the, you know, the cosine of the incoming minus the outgoing wave vectors. Okay, so this is just an example. This is copper 111. Uh, this is a DIDV map. If you take a Fourier transform, you get uh, the Fermi surface, but actually this radius is 2K, right? And if I were to do this as a function of energy, I should be able to get the surface state dispersion. So this is, uh, the, this is just the dispersion of the surface states. And in fact, if I were to plot the radius as a function of energy, I get a beautiful parabola which tells me the dispersion of the surface states. So this is quasi-particle interference. And so we can use that for, for this material. So here's what we do. We take DIDV maps at different bias voltages. Here it is a DIDV map at 25 millivolts. And look, this is, the, this is the topography and this is the DIDV map, right? And in here, inside this DIDV map are waves that you can't really see with your eye very well. Uh, however, when we do a Fourier transform, you'll see them. So before I do that, let me just show you what you expect. So here's the Brillouin zone. And most of the data I'm going to show you is above the Lifshitz transition. So what you have is these ovals which span the Brillouin zone boundary. So the scattering that you would expect, you know, the dominant scattering processes would be, for example, from, from here to here or from here to here, right? And to sort of, uh, as a first guess for what you should expect, what we always do is take the uh, constant energy contours and do a, an autocorrelation. And that tells, gives us all the possible scattering vectors we could see. So the autocorrelation of this looks like this. Okay? And now, so let's now look at the data. So this is the, this is the Fourier transform of our data. And you can see pretty much that these Q vectors, Q, what I've labeled Q2 and Q1, you can see very nicely. So here's Q2, here's Q1. And the shape of this, they lo it looks very similar, okay? All right, so, so let's do this as a function of energy. So this is Q2, this is Q1, and we're gonna track this as a function of energy. And you can see the dispersion, right? And now I can plot the dispersion for that field of view, and I get straight lines for both Q2 and Q1 approximately, so this is the dispersion. Okay, now how do I figure out what the effect of strain? What we do is we have the strain map and so we create a mask using the strain map, and we place the mask on the DIDV map, okay? And now you have red regions which have uh, one kind of strain and blue regions which have another kind of strain. And then we take a selective Fourier transform of only the red regions or the blue regions, and let's see what we see. So when we do that, so here are the Fourier transform of only the red and the blue regions, and you can see with your eye immediately that the Q vectors are different. So this is smaller than this, this is smaller than this, right? And if I were to take a line cut, you can see that quite clearly, this peak, these two peak positions are different. And then you can do that as a function of energy, and if you were to plot that, you get two parallel lines, right? 
So the compressive and the tensile strain regions have been affected by strain. The dispersion has changed. So the problem with this is you can't tell whether the dispersion has shifted vertically because perhaps the strain also goes with a potential modulation, in which case the dispersions would shift vertically, or perhaps exactly what was predicted by Liang Fu is happening, in which case the Dirac cones are moving in momentum space. In order to distinguish between these two scenarios, we can do something more. Because we have all the positions of the atoms, we don't need to constrain ourselves to compressive and tensile strain. We can actually calculate the uniaxial strain as well as the shear strain. And in fact, what we can do is we can calculate the entire strain tensor as a function of position, okay? So this is your topography. This is the diagonal component of the strain tensor. This is the other diagonal component. And these are the two off-diagonal components. And using these components of the strain tensor, we can calculate the compressive strain as a function of position, which looks exactly like I showed you before, compressive and tensile strain. But we can also calculate uniaxial strain, and this is our uniaxial strain map. Now, you might wonder how you can have both compressive and tensile strain as well as uniaxial strain in the same sample, right? And here's how it works. If you zoom into some region, this is where you have isotropic compression. You have isotropic stretching here. And here's you where you have uniaxial strain in one direction. And here's where you have uniaxial strain in the other direction. So, so I think if you think about this carefully, you'll realize that in order to accommodate this, uh, the, this, uh, this modulation, this is what the lattice needs to do, right? You have all kinds of strain in this system. OK, so now we have a, a, a cool thing we can do. We can actually map out the Fourier transform not only as a function of tens tensile and compressive strain, but also as a function of uniaxial strain. And, and then we can see what we see. So here's a movie. So what I'm going to do is this is a masked uh, area. I'm going to move the mask from a region of high compressive strain to high tensile strain and so on. And we should see what happens to the corresponding Fourier transform, right? And you can see that for if you move between tensile and compressive strain, all of these things move together. I'll show you again. So the, the, the peaks in the Fourier transform, they all either, oops, I didn't mean to do that. They all move in and out together. So in and out and in and out. OK. And we, we already saw the, this uh, previously. Right? And now I, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Let me just show you, oops, what happened to my uniaxial strain? Ah, this is uniaxial strain. Now, uniaxial strain means that you're stretching two of the atoms and compressing in the opposite direction. So correspondingly, in the Fourier transform, what you would expect to see is that two of these, while two of these peaks go in, the other two should go out, okay? So I'm moving the mask across regions of uniaxial strain, and you can see that. These, uh, these two go in, these two go out. You can see it here as well. I'll play that again. Okay? So, 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 so basically, we can use this data to not only get a qualitative view of what strain is doing, but also because we can plot the change in the momentum space position as a function of strain, we can get quantitative estimates of the effect of strain on, on the Dirac nodes in the system. And in fact, so we fit all our data, and this is our quantitative estimate of uh, these uh, constants, alpha and beta. And Basically, it's pretty close to what theory predicts for lead telluride for alpha. OK, so I've sort of run out of time. I have only 30 seconds left. And I don't want to go into this, but we found something really surprising when we did this. We found that the uniaxial strain uh, showed an orthogonal effect, meaning if you uh, stretched in one direction, the Dirac cones in the perpendicular direction would move uh, out, right? And so there's actually a reason for that, and that has to do with the orbitals in the system, but I don't want to go into that. Uh, thanks for your attention.
microscopically strain the sample to control the size of the 0.5 and the 0.8. Well, I remember one was positive and one was negative. I don't remember which, but for the strain, how much control do you have over, it, say, the amount of different domains or the degree of strain? Uh, control over. Well, for example, could you make uh, a region where the strains were like it somehow? Uh, I couldn't tell how much you can manipulate the amounts of strain by other things you can do. Inside. Yeah, no, actually, so, so there's, there's, there are a few interesting things there, right? You could homogeneously strain the system yeah, exactly. and, and check this. But the problem with that is, unless you have a way of doing this in C2, it would be, you would be looking at different samples, right? So if you want to get inhomogeneous strain like this, which is supposed to give you pseudomagnetic fields, then uh, this is one way to do it. Um, we could control the amount of strain. We just stopped at 40 monolayers where the, you know, the strain had healed and all you were left with was the supermodulation. We could have stopped earlier and the strain would be different. Yeah, so in that sense, we can control it just by stopping earlier while growing the film. I also have a question this is back to the first part. Yeah. You made a kind of, um, not, well, maybe it's a hypothesis or maybe it's more founded than that, but the late scale of disorder. I was wondering also if you can, if there's a way to probe that, like by changing the late scale, maybe you would see the mass list or axons get gapped if the disorder became too much? Yeah, so um, it's a really good question. I, so we have, it's, you know, the, the problem is the following. At 40% disorder, you're already heading in the direction of the maximum possible disorder. Mm -hmm. Because at 50%, you'll, you'll go in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So we're already, I think we've already maxed out our disorder. So the, the samples that the maximum alloy, that the largest alloy we studied was 36%. And that's already hugely disordered. And so I think the, you can ask the following question. Here's the, here's the peak at the direct point. You can ask with what precision can we determine the position of this peak? And that, that tells us how, how well we know this point is not gapped out, right? So, so I would say within a millivolt, I would say there's no mass. Compare that millivolt to this mass gap. So, the, uh, so this is about, I would say, in the maximum uh, largest uh, doping samples, this M is probably um, maybe 25 millivolts. Okay. So that's the mass. So, so you see, I mean, within a millivolt, the position of this Dirac node is pretty robust. Yeah, so I don't know. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so one thing is the, the, when you don't have rock salt, you get into ortho 62, that's the uh, crystal structure. And in fact, the, what we see on the surface is exactly ortho 62. That's what ortho 62 looks like. It has, it has this, uh, it, the two sublattices are shifted and there's a sort of a little bit of a um, change in the z-axis position of the atoms as well. And I would say if mirror symmetry is broken only in one direction, then perhaps you would still see Dirac cones in the other direction. I, I don't know. I, I, I know that theory predicts that it's topologically trivial. But, but uh, we can't go any further in that direction. I think we would have to st start in the, I think there's a miscibility limit at around 35% of tin. For the QPI? You know, uh, no. Uh, However, there's something really interesting about this material. The mobility of these alloys is extremely high, which is very strange, right? You have these disordered alloys, but they have very high low temperature mobilities. Also, when we, usually when you have inhomogeneity like this, if you look at the position of the Dirac point in real space, 
you should see a huge amount of variation. Um, in fact, we don't see that much variation. Over, you know, let's say 300 angstrom region, the position of the drag point doesn't change that much. So I don't know what, what's scattering the electrons in the system. It might be um, like vacancies, for example. You might have random vacancies. Maybe that's doing the scattering. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, 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 we could, we could, yeah. But you have to ask why. So if you have a particular reason to do it, yeah, we can do it. The QPI uh, should get stronger up to a certain point. Um, we've seen this before in other materials, yeah. If you add impurities, in fact, sometimes we have to deliberately add impurities to get better QPI. 